Oh, that. Hi there. Is everybody there? Hey, Tim, it's Candido. Hey, Candido, could you guys see my screen? I can, yes, it's the PowerPoint. Oh, fant fantastic, fantastic. I'll wait a couple of minutes before I start the meeting. Hi, Tim. Hi. Yes, I can see your screen clear. Fantastic. That's what I want to make sure that you guys can see my screen. Not my face, you can see my screen, right? But we like to see your face because we miss seeing it. Oh my God, I miss seeing you guys. You have no idea how I much. I know. It's so hard. You have hard no idea how much. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard. But you know what? We're hanging in there. Well, the, you know, before we start, the great thing is uh, that, uh, you know, aside from the poor people that are in the uh, healthcare facilities, they're being the hardest hit right now. Um, oh it seems to be the majority of the cases right now are unfortunately in those, in those facilities right now. So I believe uh, we're all doing our part and we'll be out of this and high-fiving and hugging each other before we know it. I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait to give you a big hug. Me too. I miss my office. <laughs> no, I went by the offices the last, um, uh, over the weekend, I went by all the offices. Uh, well, I've been going by, but I actually went by this time, right? And I yeah. uh, had to go by and make sure everything was okay. Yeah, I just have Liliana watering my plants. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. I need love too, you know yeah <laughs> so everything is fine there but you know we're not hit by this um, pandemic none of our agents or nobody that we know so thank god mm -hmm. very true. Hey, Tim, are the girls still in the office working yeah. jimmy what yes they are they are okay so the the um you know the uh, staff uh, the admin office is operational uh diana is in the main floor we have a receptionist at every office. Our administrators are working. Daniel and Rebecca are both working. So our offices are operational, and we really appreciate, you know, the the, the big efforts you've made not to go into the office, because um, uh, it's really made them feel a lot more secure and comfortable, right? So, it's uh, it's you know they're they're able to get things done. We have a lot of closing still that we're working with. We are getting some transactions handed in, and I'll cover that in the meeting. As a matter of fact, I'll start right away. How's that sound, guys? Good idea? You might want to wait a few minutes. There's probably more people coming. Yeah. I'll wait a couple minutes. I ran, I ran down to eat my lunch really quickly. I've been on the phone all morning. So went down, ate my lunch, came right back. leftover easter dinner no well you know it's interesting because easter for me is it, we're we're actually in holy week right now for greek orthodox all right right so um yeah so we're, we're actually starting our you know i guess our fast our lent you know we don't eat meat and and uh it's quite interesting watching church from um from youtube oh yes First time in history. First, there's a first time for everything. Of course. There's a first time for everything. But uh, again, we'll get through this. We are getting through it. And I got some great insights to provide everybody today as well. That will definitely make everybody feel very positive. Do you guys see the sign behind me? Too small? Oh, too, too small. small. It says, oh. it says, Still too small. Deals, eat people. Can I see it? Uh, can you hold a little bit, please? Great people talk about deals. Average people talk about things.
says, great people talk about ideas, average people talk about things, small people talk about other people. <laughs> Very was, funny uh, and appropriate. Greek, Greek philosopher, not Tim Sirianos. <laughs> All right, so we got five after. I'm gonna start just to respect everybody who's on the call. Um, I've created a slide deck uh, this time, and the whole idea of the slide deck is I can share it with you after. So Daniel and Rebecca uh, will be able to share the slide deck. Uh, we'll put it on our, our networking group. And it's just uh, about, about providing you with uh, as much information as possible over the past uh, week to 10 days. So let's jump into the market update. Um, our, our friends in, uh, at Broker Bay have provided us with some great information uh, over the past week. Actually, they've been providing us with great information over the past uh, three weeks. Uh, this this um, uh, information they provide us is very valuable because it gives you some insight and it provides you a picture of what's been going on in the market from a showing perspective, uh, a listing perspective, an offer perspective, and something that people don't really see a lot of, and that is the ex exclusive market. People who are putting their properties on the market, but you're not seeing them on the MLS. So let's first jump into the first slide. If you look at it on, uh, right here, it's the showings. This is first week of April versus first week of March. So this is looking uh, pre-COVID-19. It gives you the idea of how the market was really going on an upward traje trajectory. And all of a sudden, it started going this way. And now you're looking at the first week of April, and you're seeing that we've hit a certain type of plateau in showings. It's not going down. It's not going up. It's just kind of steady eddy all the way through here. Now, if you look at uh, a trend, if you look at the first week um, versus last week, so we're looking at the first week of April versus the last week, uh, pre this week, obviously, because it was a slower week, you can see that this is what was going on, and then you can see the week that just passed, how the showings are just below it, but they're about the same place week over week, right? So there, you're seeing a lot of, you're, you're, you're gonna start seeing a lot of this type of activity going on out there. And I'll explain a little bit later why we're seeing this. The market update by appointments. Here's a really interesting slide over the last 90 days. You can see the peaks and valleys that always exist that, you know, from weekends to, you know, to weekdays, certain days of the week, like a Monday may be very low. And then as the week goes on, it quickly goes all the way up and it goes up and down like this. <laughs> and as we're going into February, you can see how January was here. You can see how February was here. And then all of a sudden, March, everything went down. Now, we've seen this week and then another week then another week, as you see this right there. But now what's really interesting is you're starting to see these little things happening right here. And they're starting to go in this direction right here. Now, I don't, I don't project showings to be anywhere around here. But I am saying that after this week, we're going to probably see showings somewhere around here. It's slightly better than what we've seen here, and I'll, and I'll explain why in a second. So here are the actual uh, exclusive listings. Look at how many exclusive listings mm -hmm. there, have, there are right now going on. Now these are, exclusive listings are coming soon. They're not just the ones that are gonna remain exclusive, they're also listings that are gonna be coming, that are actually gonna be hitting the market. So you're not seeing, the reason why I'm showing you this is because you're not seeing lines down here you're seeing the same type of activity. Now you did see this happen. Instead of, instead of seeing this and this, you did see this here happen. But here we are right now, there's last week, we saw a whole bunch of properties that hit the market. And if you go back, it's almost in line with what you were seeing in February and January. Do you see that there? Mm -hmm. So obviously we had this big balloon right here. And I, don't, I hate using the word balloon because uh, you know, a lot of economists look at it as bubble and balloon is the same thing. I don't see it that way. I'm just looking at the, the, the market trend of the spring before COVID hit us and then started going this way. But again, look at this line. If you go right across, you'll see that it's not, there, there's activity there. Mm -hmm. New to MLS. So again, look at January, look at April very much similar to the beginning of the year 
to where we are right now in this place right here. So what am I trying to share with you here? We were, we've been discussing over and over again about the pause in the marketplace. It's almost like if we were to uh, take, our, take ourselves uh, into a portal and go back in time and go over the Christmas holiday into January, you can see that there was a similar type of law, obviously, you know, very different. I'm just saying from an activity standpoint of the new to MLS, it, it's not, you would think that you're in December right now. Um, now, obviously, there were more properties on the market than there are today. Um, but you can see here what's going on right there. This is a very important stat to look at. And finally, offers. You, you saw the offers peaking uh, probably on a Tuesday and Wednesday every single week. And then you saw the upward trend going all the way up to here. But then when you come down, obviously, we started seeing this. Now we're seeing some more offers coming in in the past few days to a week. So as I've told everybody, we're typically used to having somewhere between, you know, 20 and 30 transactions a day in the spring market. And we're down to about two, three a day right now. Um, you know, five a day, seven a day, like that was last week. The week before that, we were at 12, 15, 18. So it looks like what's going on right here is we've hit um, that, that um, the talk about the virus hitting its peak right now, whether we believe it or not. Uh, whether we believe that the curve is flattening or not, they, they, they tend to say that it is. But right here, you're seeing a lot, there's a lot of um, uh, upward trends within, between offers. Now, a lot of our agents that, are that I'm talking to, and I'll show you again, this is my list of people I've been talking to. You can see here, <laughs> right? I've been going through the list as much as possible. Uh, I've talked to a lot of uh, our agents uh, personally, some of them only through Zoom, still trying to get through the whole uh, entire roster. And a lot of them have actually called me directly and were talking to their clients, to, to talk to their clients and sharing with me stories. And I am hearing that certain uh, markets in the GTA, now don't forget, Toronto could be paintbrushed with one big roller. You can grab a, a gallon of paint, put it in the pot, get a roller, you can paintbrush it that way. But Toronto's not like that anymore. Uh, Toronto's very different, a lot of micro markets going on. So you'll see different activity in Trinity Bellwoods, You'll see different activity in the junction. You'll see different activity in the condo market. You'll see different activity in Richmond Hill um, and, and uh, Richmond Hill in the Vaughan region. You'll see different, a different market in Mississauga and further to Oakville and Burlington to the west and the east, and the Pickering, the Ajax, the Whitby's, you know, the Oshawa's. You'll see a different market out there. And within those markets, there's micro markets as well. So uh, I, I heard about two, three stories in the past four days of multiple offers in certain neighborhoods that have always been in high demand in the city of Toronto. And I've also heard of a lot of properties not receiving the same activity when you're looking at um, uh, areas like Mississauga or like the Miltons, uh, like the Orangevilles, you're seeing a different type of market out there. Now the sweet spot though, in the entire marketplace right now has been between the 500 and $750,000 range. Uh, up to about 800. That, that price point right now is still a very, very sweet, sweet spot for affordability. People whose their uh, jobs have not been put on hold, they have the money, they're out there looking, maybe they've sold already, uh, maybe they've given notice for their rent, um, and they've been really serious about buying. There's actually multiple offers, and there's been um, deals that have been had above asking price uh, as we speak. Now, it's not everywhere. Uh, please don't shoot me on this one. I know that there's certain areas where we've seen a five and eight percent price decrease, and the higher the price of the property, um, the less activity there is. So uh, just last week, I don't I don't believe there were any sales above 1.3, 1.4 million dollars. I don't believe there were any sales um, that happened in the majority of uh, urban Toronto and and, and north. Uh, I mean, I live in Benlo ba Benlo Banbury neighborhood which is uh, between Leslie and Bayview, Lawrence and uh, York Mills, and there have been no sales whatsoever, and there are houses for sale. The average price is between one eight and three and a half. My house is not worth three and a half. Just letting you know that, okay? <laughs> I wish it was, it's not. Um, so those, those neighborhoods are experiencing the biggest decline and the, and the biggest pressure you know, on their values. At the same time, those are the neighborhoods where sellers typically don't have to sell. They want to sell. 
people who buy a home at two, $3 million, they typically don't need to buy a home for $3 million. They choose to buy a home for $3 million. So we are gonna see a lot more people holding off. Let's, let's jump into the emotional. Any questions about the market first before I move on? Tim, I, a question. Uh, did, you, did you just, can you just clarify, did you say that there was in the entire urban GTA that were Toronto proper, there was no sales above 1.3 million? About 1.5. There were no homes that sold last week. Wow. That's not just for our office. That's for everything? I'm talking about GTA. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, there were 370 transactions on the entire MLS a week ago. Okay. That's, we're talking about an 80% drop in the entire market. Now, Andre, you can look at that as a drop in the market going towards a negative, you know, comment, or you can look at it for what it really is. And that is the same word we're using over and over and over again, which is a pause. People are, the showings, the, the showings, the activity, everything that you're seeing has been for people saying, okay, I'm pausing here, but my next information is going to be really, really important. Uh, and I, I know a lot of you have heard about the emotional passage and I want to share this information. There's a quote that I heard uh, not too long ago, and that is the mind creates fear to catastrophize everything. Okay. I want you to think about that. The mind creates fear to catastrophize everything. My quote that I did not make up. I heard it um, about three weeks ago, watching a series on TV. Uh, that, uh, you know, just watching TV, right? You're wa I'm watching Picard. That does tell you what I was watching and it, and it captivated me. I enjoyed, I'm not a Star Trek fan. I'm not a big Star Trek guy, but it really caught my attention the way he was a leader and the way he was uh, trying to do right in the universe. And there was um, a moment in the scene where I heard him say this phrase, fear is the most incompetent teacher. And when I heard him say that, it just hit every chord in my being because we cannot have fear teaching us how to act moving forward. And for those of you who know me, uh, I don't like, you know, um, having being reactive. I like being proactive. So the emotional passage is denial, bargaining, sadness, and acceptance. Um, that is the emotional passage that we all go, like human beings go through. However, you know, I, I want to share with you that my gut uh, feeling from now what I'm not what I'm hearing, but instead what I'm listening to from many of our agents and, and even our agents clients that requested to hear from me directly um, is the emotional passage. We are at acceptance right now when we're looking at that, at those four words, my stay at home, uh, experience and my emotional um, uh, experience of what I've witnessed talking to a lot of our agents and people outside is that we've gone from shock to fear and now we're at the whether you call it acceptance or you call it antsiness we are all at this place which is similar in scope so antsy what I mean is People have now gone from the shock of, I can't believe the world is going through a pandemic. They've gone through the fear where, what does that mean to me, my family, my health, my loved one's health? What does it mean to me financially overall as well? Where will I be in one week, one month, or six months from now? To antsiness, where they've actually accepted what has gone on. They've made, you know, it's common sense now that, We've, we're all doing this for the better good of the people who are uh, you know, very vulnerable. Like we're all vulnerable, but there are much more vulnerable people. And now it's the antinous. People are seeking or are starting to seek a professional to help them navigate through this time. So every single conversation that I've had with our agents has been exactly that. They're looking for advice. Many of them want to buy or sell and they're asking how to buy or sell. And you're saying, you know, I understand it's socially irresponsible. I understand the social distancing. I need guidance. 
Should I sell now? Should I wait two months? I don't have to sell. Give me the right advice. Or I want to sell because, you know, I'm no longer using this property as an Airbnb anymore. And I want to put on the market, which leads me to the a part that I want to share with you. There are, there is going to be, in my humble opinion, a lot more inventory in the condo market because a lot of people with the new Airbnb rules and how long it will be before we're, they're able to use their investment as a hotel. And hotels are going to suffer the longest. Um, are going to say, okay, I cannot afford a negative cash flow. It's time for me to put it on the market. And make no mistake, there are a lot of actual buyers that have been waiting for inventory, not for one month, not for six months, not for one year. Inventory has been a 20 year problem. It has been a problem. It's been the root of the entire problem that we've had in the city of Toronto. I will remind everybody that they've talked about a vacancy tax. They've talked about an investment tax. They talked about, you know, the new Airbnb rules for so long, all these things have been going on, uh, trying to create inventory. Well, I believe that right now, for the first time in, uh, I can't count how many years, that the city of Toronto will finally get a good stock reflection of just how many units or how many properties were used without long-term rental capability, or how many properties uh, will now hit the market. They'll see just how many, what percentage that they didn't know about, they're gonna find out in the next month or two. So, now the conversation I'm having with a lot of our agents is I need a professional. I need the right guidance. I need information to guide me through this time. And I understand, you know, I, I get it. We're all living this together. We have to wear masks. We have to wear gloves. Tim, I have a few questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay. So we got the stats from Broker Bay. And uh, you mentioned that uh, homes, no homes were selling over 1.3 last week. Yeah. Um, now, does that include, uh, looking at the stats from the Broker Bay uh, presentation, we saw that exclusive listings went down only 36%, whereas like the new MLS listings were down quite su uh, substantially, like 61%. Um, do, does that stat or what you're saying, 1.3, include data from exclusive listings? And so these are only, so just to answer that first question, Marlon, this yeah. is only through Broker Bay because Broker Bay is the only platform in Toronto that has an exclusive network that we can rely on and tap into. Okay, so are there other data points, you know, perhaps other agents have pocket listings that aren't reporting on MLS? So there would not, those would be called pocket listings. Those are not allowed under RICO. I mean, do agents have, is it possible that agents in Toronto uh, have listings that they have not submitted to their offices? Yes. Is it well, possible? They're not on me? MLS, right? Exclusively Sorry? not on MLS. One more time. Like, exclusive listings, they wouldn't be on MLS. So how would, how would we know the price that it's sold for? No, so we don't have the sold values of the exclusive listings. There's no mechanism or data entry point that is readily available for all of us to tap into. The only way I can provide you that information is from a broker to broker perspective. So I can provide, I would have to go into our system and look at what we've sold exclusively, which is not that much. Okay, because the information that suggests that, you know, people are listing more exclusively than on MLS during this time because no, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't paintbrush it that far I, it's there could be people so there's, there's a two point there's a two-part answer to that there could be people who are exclusive because they do not want people through their home right yeah. um, there could be people who are exclusive who who are using they've gone exclusive to ease into the market, right? And yeah. they're, or, or pulled off the market, but they're still on the market, if that, if that makes sense, right? 
And there are people who are coming soon. They're exclusive today. And what you're seeing is that little uptick because they are coming soon. Like they're actually going to be on the market in three, five, 10 days from now, two weeks from now. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, because I have, and then you also mentioned that, you know, we're going to see an increase of condo listings. And I have uh, one that was supposed to go up um, before all of this. And um, I just took it, I, they just signed the paperwork to get it on the market now. But I'm still kind of dealing with, you know, different ideas of how to kind of sell it. You know, uh, do we sell it virtually? I know I have an assignment um, that I posted exclusively just today, but this one is already built. So I know different condos are saying no showings at all uh, to protect their residents. Um, in this one in particular, uh, the management just said keep it to a minimum, uh, whatever that means. And, you know, my feeling that's, is... That sounds like, a, like an elephant can walk through that one. Yeah, right? And okay. for me, I'm feeling like I don't really want, um, you know, showings given the demographic of the building. I know there's a lot of elderly people that live in the building and, you know, I don't want to affect them in any way. But, you know, how do we get, you know, our properties being sold exclusively? Are they being, if they're on MLS, what are some of the measures that it's other builders are taking to get it sold? You know, I'd love to hear, you know, from other people who sold properties that are, you know, on the resale market during this time, like how are they, you know, keeping everyone safe? including like all their, the photographers, the stagers, are they even getting it staged during this time? So what I'll do is, is if with, with everybody's permission, I'm going to stop after my next two slides and we'll talk about that. Cause I'm going to cover those, that information in my next two slides. Okay. Okay. So, um, again, keeping that in mind of what is happening and, and what they're doing. I want to share with you that Broker Bay uh, has all the large brokerages um, under contract. So all the uh, large brokerages in, like we'll say about half the membership almost of Toronto MLS is using the exclusive network. So when you put a property on the market, it will go to you know, over 50% of the realtors because their offices use Broker Bay as a front office system as well, okay? It's a very important point. So now the key is to accept what we're going through, adapt and deliver. And let's talk about home inspectors. <laughs> so are they, are they working and are they essential? Well, the answer is that they, any, any business that is um, uh, part of facilitating an essential service in that sense is essential. So the, the home inspectors right now, uh, their insurance does not cover uh, the health provisions that are required under COVID-19. And their association has been very, has, has used pretty strong direction um, not to do home inspections because of insurance reasons. So the best way to get around that, now there are home inspectors who are doing them. There are, there are agents um, that, um, in our office who have home inspectors that are using, uh, that, that they, they're able to use. And I've asked our agents to share those home inspectors so they can share it with the rest of the group. So our transactions that are in process can be handled. The other idea you have is to provide an indemnity form to the inspector. And the indemnity form to the inspector would be that the inspector is indemnified by both the buyer and the seller not for, their, not for the service they're providing as a home inspection. However, they're indemnified from ever being accused of transmitting or transferring COVID-19 to anybody in the household. Okay, so part of the concern is the inspector getting sick or giving, the, or giving COVID to somebody else in the property. So there are indemnities that we have in place that we can provide. Obviously working with COVID uh, form that we've created, it does work. We can use that, that form, but we can also have a, um, we can take that clause in our COVID form and just add home inspector to Remax Ultimate and that should cover the insurance that's required. Now, 
I spent the last four days thinking really hard without focusing on the problem, trying to find a solution to what happens if home inspectors completely stop and do not provide the service to our agents. And I came up with a solution. It looks like it's time that we use the SPIS. Don't forget that um, the warranties that a seller is bound to with, uh, with their warranties of disclosing uh, defects in the property have never been eliminated. The purpose of a home inspector was to provide a buyer with comfort in you know, how many years before the roof needs changing, um, is there mold, is there like some moisture evidence, is electrical panel up to date? All these kind of things are the reasons why we did home inspections. And SPIS put a lot of pressure on sellers and they were frowned upon by a lot of people in the industry. Well, you know, when, we're, when we are in a state that we are in today and home inspectors may not be going to houses, then we have no choice but to use an SPIS. And a seller property information you know, sheet that discloses everything about the property, when things have been updated, um, asking the seller to warrant um, if there's been any leaks or any other damages in the property, that may be something that will assist our clients with some form of peace of mind, you know, for the short term until inspectors are fully operational the same way. Any questions about that? No? No. All right. So, so Tim, so, sorry, just real quick, just to, just to sum it up. Are you saying that there are no home inspectors working right now, or there no. are some home inspectors, there are selected ones that some are choosing to, some are not? Yes. So some, there are inspectors who are choosing to work through this. Um, mm -hmm. There are some home inspectors that our agents have used over and over and over again who've said, who've said they're, they're not working right now. It's mm -hmm. not a blanket, Jimmy, that everybody's right. not working. There are home okay. inspectors who are. All I'm adding is that in the event that we get down the road where we don't have any home inspectors, mm -hmm. or we can't find a home inspector, then maybe it's time that we use the SPIS. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, and I, again, I'm just trying to find a solution to what we're going through on an hour by hour, day by day basis, right? Um, again, there's, there's agents in our office that have contacted me, uh, calling other agents, trying to find an inspector, bingo, they found one. And I said, hey, share that inspector's name with me. That inspector's gonna get a lot of business from our office uh, right now, especially if you don't have an inspector. Mm -hmm. So virtual open houses. Um, how many of you know that uh, Trev, uh, ha and through Stratus, has now provided a virtual link where you go into your admin section, where you add your open house and you can add a Facebook live or other type of live link. So you can do a virtual open house. Are you guys aware of this? No. Okay. So yes. if you log into Stratus and uh, you go into, you go into um, uh, your admin section where you add your open house, well, first what you do is you go to your Facebook account and you, or you go to your Zoom account and uh, you create a link, an actual appointment from two o'clock, what time that your open house starts to nine o'clock at night. Now, the reason why you have your open house till nine o'clock at night is because on the websites, when, when the actual um, open house ends, your feed ends completely. So whatever you've saved ends completely. So you want to have it longer because that way, whatever you've recorded on live will stay there on the link. So what happens is you create a Facebook live link or you create a zoom link. You go into your admin section, you paste that in the open house section where it says uh, virtual open house. Then you go to the property yourself, you click on the link and then anybody who wants to watch, the open house can do so from anywhere in the world while you're at the actual house by yourself. Now, once you add this to Treb Home, and once you add this to your Stratus, it also appears on Treb Home. It also appears on Realtor.ca. 
Oops. There is, um, sorry, Tim, one thing. There, if you go, if you just log into Treb on the home page, in right on the news on the left hand side, the very top will give you further instructions, like step by step, of what Tim just said. Okay, it says virtual open houses. They started it last Monday. Um, and it'll give you step by step instructions right on Treb. Yeah. So, again, these are to, to Marlon's point, this is a tool right that you can do if you're actually out there if you're if you're at the actual uh, property you can show it to uh dozens of people all in one shot through the through your phone and you're having like a live open house but it's virtually at this time uh the other thing that's going on is broker bay has launched um a matterport a matterport uh affiliation does anybody know about this mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so the way that works is these people are actually on the same, what Jen just said, when you go on how to do a virtual open house, you could put the Matterport tour in there and you can actually have real time tour viewing and control sharing. So you can have more than one person interacting and, and seeing it through Matterport instead of being there. There's a whole different level of, um, uh, a whole different level of doing a virtual open house to answer questions I'm on the fly. I'm kind of confused. If you don't mind uh, clarifying, I might, I might be a little um, confused, but when someone's doing a virtual open house with maybe a dozen other agents or other people, just in general, buyers uh, logging into Zoom and you've already gone through half the property, I'm, I'm not quite sure. How does it work? Like, what do people do? Can you go to the beginning of the house and walk in again, please, Andre, or... Yeah, <laughs> basically, basically, Andre, you're walking through the property very slowly. Everybody that I've, you know, the way I'm thinking about it out loud and Jen can jump in too, is that you would have to, you'd have to kind of like be very patient and walk very slow and look at your phone to see what kind of comments and what kind of streaming you're getting of people, right? And uh, this might sound really silly to you, but um, I'm a Tommy Bahama fan. Uh, and they had a live feed on how to do at six o'clock at night, not during business hours. Okay. Just making it clear. It was after hours. It was six o'clock Eastern standard time on how to make a mojito. Tommy Bahama style. So I actually oh, yeah. watched that live with this lady and I actually said hello from Toronto, Canada. And she stopped in the middle of her live and she said, Hey, it's Toronto. And she communicated with me just through that. So that's really what she did. And that's what you would do as well. <clears throat> so essentially it's like doing a live Facebook post, but you're doing it at the open house, Tim? For, Am I going to stay the there for one, nine hours? Is that For this one, yes. You would put two o'clock and you would have the open house finish at say nine o'clock at night, because even though you're done your live, the video will stay with that link until oh, nine o'clock. So people night. can go back and check the video Correct. at that point. Correct. Correct. Little trick <laughs> that, I, that you can do in there, right? So, but the yeah. Matterport is different. It's, it's already a done virtual tour, mm -hmm. but you can post it, have people go in, and you can actually interact. As you can see here, you can interact with them. Okay. I know that there's, you know, Obviously, there's a lot of new ways to kind of market the properties uh, during this time. But, you know, before we even get to market a property, the conversation that you're going to have with your clients are going to be based on, you know, what the value is. If we're looking at, you know, in Toronto specifically, there's always, a, you know, a list price. Then there's a market value. Then there's a sale price when you, you know, look, see how many multiple offers you get. That's always have been really confusing for buyers and sellers, you know, the list price, the market value, and then, you know, call it 10, 20% more because you had multiple offers. Now, you know, now in this coronavirus, you're not getting the multiple offers, so you lose that value right there. And then you're back to market value, and then you're trying to estimate based on the, the few data points that we have due to the lack of sales to figure out what the, what the coronavirus price is. You know, like how much someone's willing to pay in this pandemic. Um, I tell my clients, well, it has to be worth my while before I go out to look at a house. So how much am I, 
how much are we actually decreasing, you know, prices by, or what are we giving, you know, what values are we giving to our clients at this time for both, um, you know, sales and for leases? Oh, you're done? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> does anybody, does anybody want to comment before mm -hmm. I comment? Anybody have any experience they want to share with their clients? All right. So it's all on me then. <laughs> um, so what, what I said earlier is holding true. And that is there's been sellers who've said, for example, my house would have sold for around $800,000. And I understand that we're in where we are in right now. And I'm accepting the fact that I will sell for slightly less and buy for slightly less. So I've seen some, I've seen uh, anywhere between in some areas, you know, as much as a 10% drop in value. I've seen that. Um, but I've also seen the sellers here saying, I don't have to sell. I'm not going to sell. I'll, not, I'll just wait. I'll wait it out because they feel that things will come back to where they were before. Now the rental market, I feel is a little bit different. I do believe that there'll be a lot more properties for lease and that will probably soft land the values or if not decrease the values by 50 or a hundred dollars a month, if not a little bit more in certain condoms, right? So we are going to see, we are seeing a softening in that market. We will see a softening in that market. The, the answer that you're looking for, I don't think anybody has the answer because Toronto is so micro in neighborhoods. There was a property that sold for a hundred thousand over asking price that uh, an agent in her office had and her clients are still kicking themselves for not buying it in the East end. And there's another example I had on the weekend talking to one of our agents where our agent said, in a, in, if it was a month ago, that house would have sold for 115, 11115, and sold for 1 million 50, right? So if you look at 10%, that's 10% right there. Um, but it also comes down to what the client needs are. Do they need to sell? If they don't need to sell, then they could set their value based on the last sold price and see what happens. There's a condo for 1 million one uh, down in, it's not Mimico, but it's like a South Etobicoke, you know, the condos down there. And it's all the, how, all the condos sold for 1 million 50, uh, no, sorry, 1.5, if I'm not mistaken, for the same size. This one's asking roughly the same amount of money, but it's not getting any appointments or showings right now. Well, that's, absolutely a reflection of what's going on right now with people staying home and not going out. But the question is, where are we going to be in two months from now or three months from now? And I sincerely don't believe we're going to be in the same place we are today. I'm listening to a lot of people who want to go to market. They're getting antsy and I'm not making it up. I'm not trying to blow smoke and make you feel good. <laughs> you know, I'm just telling you that like, I'm listening to this from a lot of people. They're getting no, I, I believe you. I've, I've I had a lot of conversations over the, the weekend with our agents who are in the same boat, right? They might not absolutely have to sell, but they're getting to a point where they, they want to, you know, their income isn't affected. They had plans, you know, they're looking at post kind of COVID life. Um, and I do, I do think that there is a lot of like pent up hostility to kind of get, going right we're just kind of waiting for somebody to just say okay you can go and it's safe to do so but in um, question your question is what price do you give a client is that correct yeah so we, we can't we can't really reflect on the multiple offer uh pricing anymore you know all we can really show them is what sold before COVID, and what has sold right now and ask them point blank, is that something they're willing to accept? Yeah, but in, some, in, in a lot of communities, there haven't been any comparables. You know, the ones that we work in, you know, W1, 2, 3, 4, like just nothing, just absolutely nothing. There's been nothing for and sale, so, right? 
yeah, or nothing that sold, you know, recently that seems to be a, a, you know, a good comparable for anything that I have, you know, coming up. And for like, and for leases, like I have two leases, you know, uh, that might be coming up soon too. And I was, I was going to run this by you um, as well, but I was suggesting maybe we lower the price to something, you know, remarkably low for the first four months. And then after four months, hopefully this all clears, we start raising the price. So it's kind of like a uh, tiered pricing that you'll see maybe in a commercial setting. So the first four months, maybe, you know, 1800 just so that we can submit payments because people can make the payments and then after four months go back to normal rents so that they could you know recover some sort of loss maybe easier for people who are coming into a rental during this time but like to for someone to say like they were really usually getting 3300 and all of a sudden getting 2800 if it's like a normal lease well guess what when when things normalize you're not you're not going to get 3300 till how long because you can only increase it by two percent per year right so it's, it's very important that the way you structure that lease uh for everybody listening right now this is this is critical you can't do a lease of 2800 for four months and then going to 3200 after that you have to lease it out as 3200 dollars the rebate for four months your lease documents have to say 3200 dollars, and then in the body of the offer you have to say that you're giving the the tenant a rebate for four months. You can't do the other way around. Okay. Uh, Tim, on the standard lease, there's a there's a section that you fill out if there's rent discount, and that would be the section to fill that out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just know that uh, 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 it just depends on on um, making sure that you don't get caught. Right. I haven't seen the standard lease if they've covered that, but I'd much rather have it the other way around. They're they're not no. What I'm referring, in the standard lease as it is right now, there's a section if it, that talks about rent discount, and that would be the section to fill okay. out. You're going to do that, so be very careful. That's right. And so the, you would lease it the, the other thing, amount, though. Yes, and the other thing that I would be that I was shaking my head on is, uh, in some ways, I don't want to sound Mr. Negative. Uh, it's going to be in, people's incomes and people's jobs are going to be at stake, and that's going to well, that's going to change rent prices as well. Yeah. Again, I, I'm I am forecasting a bigger supply in condos. Like I am seeing a bigger. I'm, 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 I, there's definitely going to be more. It's about how much how much uh, pent up demand has there been? How much of it will be absorbed? Is the question that we don't know yet, right? Because supply has been uh, the number one discussion point in Toronto real estate for over 20 years. So now we're going to see just how many cons are going to hit the market and how quickly they're absorbed. So I've talked about the virtual open houses, right? And there's something that I also wanted to share with the group that's extremely important. And that is, you know, is this virus short lived? Will, you know, will we be back to normal? Why the adoption of all, all this technology? And I want to share a vision and not provide a react and not provide reactive advice, right? So <clears throat> pretend that there is no COVID-19. How would this benefit a client that saw the property in real life, but the spouse or partner is out of town? So obviously, now that we're, you know, pretend there was no COVID-19, by having the Matterports and the FaceTime lives and everything else, it's a benefit. We're learning, um, uh, life has forced us to, to adopt and learn different things that we could have used even if there wasn't any COVID, right? We are living with COVID presently, and this is a tool that allows you to provide a better experience and shows your clients that you are ready with all the tools to do the best job for them, and pardon the spelling mistakes. Um, so the whole idea now is I want to bring it to your attention because you're gonna be sitting in front of clients, and yes, you're gonna be talking, as Marlon said about, there's no more multiple offers, and there aren't enough comparables, um, I still recommend this value based on what was happening before you know, this. This is where I see the overall market because you know, what I used to do and what we all used to do before the market ran up the way it did was, and appraisers do the same thing. If there's nothing for sale in the neighborhood that 
you want to appraise or evaluate, then you're forced to go outside that neighborhood and then make percentage adjustments by comparing those neighborhoods to the ones that you're trying to evaluate, if that makes sense, right? So, you know, it's not in um, uh, South Etobicoke, in W01, but it's in W02. Okay, what percentage of evaluation, like what percentage would you put on that value? If you had to, if that was the only comparable you had, what compare, like what percentage would you put or what dollar amount would you put on the difference? to justify the difference. So we are forced to go outside of the micro that we are used to. Like we used to have enough comparables by two by three streets or right next door. If we don't have that, then we have to go further out and we have to, again, add a percentage to bring it back to that plus minus and bring it together. And at the end of the day, what is, what is market value? What a willing buyer and a willing seller are willing to transact that Without any undue, uh, with, without any undue pressure, so um, you you'd have to you know dig down into your into your uh, definitions and into into your toolbox and use these examples with your seller and say that this is what you recommend you do. You recommend you know you look at a house that's a little bit further away. Yes, obviously your street's better. You have a better exposure. You have better heavy duty nails and better grass and better bushes and whatever else you know is better. But this is how I'm evaluating it. And this is why I'm coming to this price. Because if you don't put it at this price, people in today's market will drive those two blocks and buy that house instead. So you'll have to do that. Now, let's remember how you felt in your last holiday. At the same time, point number three. This is a very important point, guys, because I want to provide perspective in every meeting we ever have. I want you to picture your last holiday, where you were. Maybe you were on a beach, maybe you were sitting on a patio, or maybe you were sitting in a museum, or you were walking among some ancient ruin. And I want you to think about how you were in awe and how you were completely blown away with your surroundings and how you felt. And then you pulled out your super duper phone, your iPhone, you know, your iPhone Pro Max Pro, whatever, 11 or you pulled out your Samsung 10,000K, or you pulled out your Nikon camera with a big lens, and you pointed it, and you took a picture, and you took a video, and then you came back, and you showed your family and your friends that weren't with you that picture and that video. Did they feel the same way looking at that picture or video as you did being at that place? No way. No. It's impossible. Okay. So you didn't feel the energy. You didn't feel anything like that. And this is what I want to write right here. We have to use technology today and God bless. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart and deepest parts of my soul. This has opened up your eyes, our eyes to different ways of providing different tools and becoming much more efficient in our business. But nothing will ever replace the feeling of the energy people feel by walking into that house. People want to feel if it's a happy home. People want to feel that, it's, that it feels right for their family. And no virtual tour can ever, ever replace that. So... Again, I'm showing you these virtual tours today. I'm talking about these virtual tours, but I also wanted to bring to your attention that let's not swing the pendulum too far one way and get caught up just in that one way of doing things. Now, because we are where we're at, we are expanding though our COVID-19 presentation. And Jen does not know this yet, but I spent my weekend looking at the presentation on how we can create it for our agents so you can have a more elaborate presentation for your clients. So we're gonna use not the one page working with COVID, we're gonna use the package working with COVID, but we're gonna outline in there the processes, how showings are confirmed, what tools, technology, and protocols we, we, we have in place as agents at Remax Ultimate to provide comfort and confidence for our clients to use our services. So I do believe in my heart 
and I, you know, it's okay to disagree with each other. This is what uh, friends are all about, right? It's about disagreeing and still having love for each other after. We're going to have an extension, if not already, an extension of the emergency order. And we're going to be, at some point in early or mid-May, the economy has to open up again. But COVID won't be gone. So we need to accept it right now. Now we are going to be working with COVID for several months thereafter. So what we need to do is not stare at the tree and look at the forest. Like let's not, you know, uh, focus on the one thing and we need to look at how we're going to interact with our clients and help them navigate through this whole process. And it's April the 14th. Believe it or not, we're already two weeks through April. We're probably three weeks away from parts of the economy opening up. And if that starts to happen, you know, if there is antsiness, there's going to be people who want to go out there. You can't start preparing yourselves three weeks from today. We need to start preparing ourselves today so we're ready and we're slowly, gradually evolving into the new way of working. Um, it's important. Any questions so far? It, it would be nice to um, see maybe a list of um, <clears throat> service providers like photographers or inspectors who are working and um, who's like, you know, certain, um, and just to know that they're taking the right measures during this time to protect themselves and our clients. So something that's been approved by Remax Ultimate during this time, because I know we all have our photographers, but you know, my photographer, for example, is not doing condos um, at the moment. Um, so I'd like to know which ones are and what their measures, what measures they're taking to keep so, everyone safe. So home launch, home launch uh, that we use are working. I know Ryan Baum is working. Uh, he does all our videos in our office for all our office events. Um, you can, uh, we, if you reach out to Daniel um, at the office or we'll post it in our Facebook uh, networking page, uh, he's working. He reached out to us just last week and told us that he's taking all the protocols and, and uh, if we can help uh, Remax, if you can help Remax Ultimate in any way, uh, he's, here, he's here to help us. Um, so yes, it's a great idea, Marlon, and we'll make sure that we get that out. Okay, but homelaunch.ca um, and Ryan are two, and we need a home inspector uh, or, or three home inspectors or, or four home inspectors to make sure that we're all prepared. But the message here is uh, uh, there is antsiness in the marketplace right now. There are people who are, who are asking the question of their agents. Um, there's, 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 um, uh, people, your colleagues who have three, four or five listings, they're just sitting there right now, ready to go, like ready to go. And they're holding off their client. They're saying, you know, let's wait one or two more weeks, one or two more weeks, one or two more weeks, right? Like let's hold off a little bit longer. And the client say, okay, okay. But you know, let's get the house ready though. How can we virtually stage it? How can we get the measurements and everything else done? So there, there is activity that you're not seeing happening out there. Finally, the Canadian Emergency Relief Plan, CERB, as it's been called so many times. Does anybody have any questions about it? Has everybody taken the opportunity to apply? <laughs> so it is open to real estate agents. If you have not received a payment in 14 days, you can apply for the emergency benefit. It's $2,000, it's taxable and it will go into your account within several days. Uh, Mike Kennedy on a previous call was very kind to, to speak up and, and share that. He had that experience. Um, at the same time, uh, I did spend uh, several days last week and over the weekend talking to my accountant and um, accountants, accountants in his uh, circle and they made it very clear to me, do not take advantage of it. Make sure you qualify, make sure that you know you get advice from your accountant and um, because the government will come hard to people who are using it or abusing it. Um, if you have assistance, they qualify for the CERB. Um, it's actually in some cases better than going on EI. If you have over, you know, if, um, 
If you can demonstrate that you had a 15% decrease in activity, which you all can, and 30% decrease in April and 30% decrease in May, not, not collectively, just a 30% uh, decrease, then you can, and, you're, and you have your, any of your assistants on payroll, you can also apply for the wage subsidy. And that will cover up to 75% of their payroll, which is better than 55%. And they will continue to work for you, continue to get, uh, keep you organized. And what the government has asked is to top them up by paying the 25% more. Because the whole idea of the plan is to keep them employed, right? Um, so that's, that's basically the update for, for that right now as well. Any questions? Uh, Tim, I have one question about the 14 days. Yeah. Uh, I remember you mentioned once in, uh, in one of your write-ups is that if you get paid on closing day, you said you, it's deemed to have been paid on closing day, not when you get the commission check. That's one. one. Two, is it, do you have to wait 14 days after closing to apply or you can, yeah? I, I don't know. You don't know? I don't know that one. I don't have to wait 14 days. I believe that that um, it's the anticipation of you not receiving um, any more payments for 14 days. But if you go to the website, like literally, if you go to if you put the CRB Google and, and it comes to the Canadian website and you read it, it's so spelled out, Andre. Like it's it's really simple. I know a lot of our agents have applied for it, and I'm and I'm saying, listen, uh, for sure. I mean, this is this is these are these are times where. Um, uh, it's, it's good for you to, to, to make sure you have the cash flow. You would have been, you know, working at a whole different level if, if COVID was not around. So it's, there's nothing wrong with applying, especially when you're home taking care of, um, of uh, loved ones, uh, you know, being home that way. What can you do? And, 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 accord, and according to CREA, uh, if you're not getting paid, but you're still, you have a listing you're doing, you're still doing showings, that doesn't, constitute you getting paid correct but it also like it's, i guess I, I just want to see if you know but it's still still considered you're working and then uh, according to cre you have to you have to have stopped working <clears throat> so um demonstration of that is is that you're not anticipating to receive any payment in 14 days you'll have no sale right that's the way i interpret it but uh a quick question to your account to get something in writing. I mean, as long as you reach out to somebody like your accountant and they respond to you with your good apply, then at least you can demonstrate to the government that you are not trying to take advantage of anything. Right. And worst case scenario, you just pay the $2,000 back, which I doubt you will. I mean, they're just, they, they just know that a lot of people are, are going to try to take advantage of different things. And there might be some employers out there who are going to take advantage of certain things that they shouldn't. Right. We're not doing that. Um, <laughs> uh, our payroll is still the way it was. I mean, Jen's on the call. Jen, have you seen any difference from me on your on your employment status? What? Can't hear you. I said not. I said not yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. She threw the old <laughs> "not yet" in there. <laughs> I'm going to shake it up a little. Somebody's got to. Yeah. Uh, Tim, if um, say you get paid, on, you got paid on March 15th and you expect another payment in June 1st. Apply. You technically apply? Yep. It's a month. It's every month is separate. So you can apply. Okay. Hey, Tim, I'm on the website. I got the verbiage. It says um, the benefit will be available to workers who are or expect to be without employment or self-employment income for at least 14 consecutive days in the initial four-week period. Perfect. Okay. That answers the question. I'm like, can you can you copy and paste that and just put it in the chat? Uh, you're assuming I'm that <laughs> literate. Come on. Well, I want to share. I want to share I'll with the entire it. group that this is. The first time I've actually done a screen share with Zoom. Okay, so I went on and I basically crossed my fingers and I, I just, you know, did what I had to do and it worked. So if I can do it, you can do it. I'm kidding. 
Thanks for the confidence, but uh, I'm on my laptop and I pulled it up on my cell phone. So I don't think I'm going to okay. be able to, but I'll try. Okay. So uh, does anybody have any questions? I want to make sure that... Vivi yeah, Tim, I, I, I do. Go ahead. I do. Uh, it's Jimmy here. So I, I noticed in an email that uh, Remax has put uh, some kind of deal in place with Zoom. Yes. And they mentioned, they mentioned uh, a free account with uh, or a, a f basic with upgrades i'm not sure where can i get a little more clarification on that so so the account that i know of jimmy is for broker owners right i'm not sure if it's for every single agent um i myself did not sign up for it because um we already paid for it we already paid for a one year um i mean we're going to continue on with this we love the way it's working um, but we're going to continue to, to do it. But I think it was for broker owners. Um, let me look into it and then I'll, I'll blast yeah. up everybody if it is for everybody. And then, so was, as a, as a sub question, for brokers. Yeah. as a sub Sorry. question to that, um, you know, what, what is like, what are agents right now who are currently doing virtual presentations and open, what are they using? What platforms are, are available that are, you know, not going to, put additional cost on a, you know, our businesses right now. Um, can I jump in? Go ahead. Sure. So, so Jimmy, you do, you can have a free zoom account. Um, you the the only real kind of downside to the free account is that you, um, can only have 40 minute meetings. So if you want to do a listing or a, buyer or whatever, um, you'd have to keep it under 40 minutes within that free um, Zoom account. Um, some other things that you could look at um, that are free are Google Hangouts. Um, that, that allows you to have multiple people in a space as well if you use Google as like a platform. Um, or you can also, if you're iPhone to iPhone, you can use FaceTime. Those are the most common that are being used right now. But if you want to set up that okay. meeting that we were talking about, we can do that alternatively outside of this as well. WhatsApp too. Okay. I'll let you know. Yeah. So yeah. WhatsApp, Thanks. so WhatsApp is a really good one. Thank oh, yeah, you. WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Yeah. WhatsApp is fantastic. Um, I know that uh, Daniel. But it's not really a well. meeting. It's not really a meeting room, right? WhatsApp? Uh, no. It's They're trying to wonder. do a, you know, a professional, you know, presentation to people, right? Yeah, um, WhatsApp is uh, is a little bit more kind of like virtual showing, virtual open house um, use. Uh, Zoom would probably be the best um, platform for that. But again, you can have a free account um, and we can look into that. Can I share something mm -hmm. if you don't okay. mind without going off topic? And I'm mm -hmm. sorry for, mm -hmm. um, I just want to share this with you. This mm -hmm. is... Uh, Bell and Rogers, uh, due to what's been going on in the world and the amount of usage, their networks were never ever set up to properly <coughs> handle the difference between commercial and residential use. So you're going to experience, if not already, if you have experienced, a lot of drop calls on your cellular, cellular networks. And a lot of, so try to use your landline as much as possible if you're working from home, if it's possible, right? This is on April 2nd, the bell outage that was going on in the heat zone in Northern, like along the 401 and like in Toronto. I want to show, share with you just how bad, you know, it is. This is Rogers. So this is, this is exactly what's going on right now in the world because they, were never, they never anticipated to have so many people working from other devices and networks and overload you know, all these other networks. So if you are experiencing uh, connection problems, uh, make no, make, please make no mistake, this is not, I'm not sure to defend Remax Ultimate or any other company, this is a phenomenon that's going on right now. So just be aware um, of what's going on. Just have to share that because I know that um, you should be checking your spam folders a lot, lot more and your emails a lot more regularly because there are emails that are not hitting uh, our agents' um, 
uh, our agents' accounts as well. Uh, can, I, can I add something uh, to what Jimmy was asking about sure. uh, platforms, what to use? Yeah. Uh, I just joined Zoom uh, about a week ago and I asked the help of Jen as well as uh, Rebecca. Uh, they're both very knowledgeable uh, on, the, on the topic. And uh, Rebecca actually uh, knew, you know, the differences between, you know, uh, getting up a $20 uh, per month plan versus a $53 a month plan for webinars. So Jimmy, I think it depends on what you want to use it for. If you just want to use it for just touching base with people, then maybe the free account is good for you. If you actually want to do a webinar with clients um, or you, you plan on using it for more of a professional uh, platform. I, I, I do like the Zoom platform. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What is more of a, you know, I guess go on right. with stuff like that. But yeah, Zoom, I'm looking for a professional, you know, it seems like Zoom is the one, right? So well, Jimmy, they're using Zoom right now, so it's, it's pretty good. Jimmy, this is yeah. this is the two hundred dollar a year Zoom platform. Just so to let you know, mm -hmm. so we didn't. Pay that's unlimited call, unlimited call time length. That's unlimited. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The only difference yeah. is that it, it's maximum. Uh, I think a hundred people, and if I need yeah. to go mm -hmm. to higher than a hundred, then I'll just upgrade. To, you know, the next level up and get up to five hundred. But um, and then right. it'll jump to like fifty something dollars a month, which is fine, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've never had a uh, hundred people at any of our meetings. So I thought I would just mm -hmm. test it this way and, and see what happens, right? So, and, and our, next, our next stage, just so you know, as an office, um, is to actually provide this platform as well as our in-person platform simultaneously. So we want to be able to provide both experience from people be driving or not being able to make it to a meeting, but being able mm -hmm. to log in and participate with the office. Um, uh, as much as possible. Okay. Okay. Great. Any other questions, guys? Hey, Tim, it's Peter. Uh, just want to step back to uh, uh, what Marlon was talking about the uh, the leases and so if uh, because I'm going to be talking to a client today about putting up a lease and um, if they do agree to offer some kind of incentive, say a discount of two hundred dollars for four months. Would we put that in the um, uh, the client's uh, comments uh, so that the public could see it as well and see that as incentive? We wouldn't put it just in the in the uh, brokerage comments because obviously the public couldn't see. I mean, what I'm saying is that want to that's possibly an incentive for them to to look at yours before they look. I believe so. Yes. Um, okay. I, I believe that'd be the best approach to take, and and uh, I don't know how Treb or any board MLS would handle that. Uh, but I can't see why it would be a problem because your client is offering an incentive for the first four months. Right, and then it just has to be documented in the, uh, the Ontario standard lease. As, but again, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it's really important, my opinion, is your lease must say the amount they're gonna be paying after four months. Correct, correct. Okay. Um, yeah. So on the list price, it would say, to say for example 2000 and then in the comments below you could put uh, uh 200 you know you could highlight it with some stars 200 dollars discount for four months that's correct of, right? correct because right. you want it to be on realtor.ca where they don't see the the uh, i know exactly comment. what you're after and you're right yeah okay you're right yeah thank you and just so everybody knows i actually sold a condo back in december uh, and the agent actually used uh, FaceTime. It was a $1.150 $1 million. Uh, yeah, so $1.15 million condo with FaceTime. And that was before COVID. So it does work. Uh, this, this particular client of the, uh, the buyer's agent knew the building. So if there's a specific building they're looking for, they know the building they've lost out in there before, it does work the uh using the uh the virtual if there's if they want to be in a specific building especially thank you peter i think the message here is that there's something for everyone right it's not one size fits all and we just have to figure out how our clients want to be communicated with and deliver the message the way they want it okay so it's no different in our meetings as an office with all of you 
we know <clears throat> that some of you will see the email that we send out once a week. And we know a percentage of you won't see it. We know a percentage of you will see our Twitter feed or our Instagram feed and another portion of you won't see it. You know, then we, some of us actually resort to some messages being sent out by paging, right? Like using the word paging, we're using it to go out in a different format. So that way it has a different ringtone on your phone when you receive it. The same thing, like we always think of different ways to communicate with you. The same thing needs to be done for our clients going forward. Some people will always, always, always uh, want to, you know, walk through the house or the property, the condo. And some people, if they already know about it, will feel comfortable in not walking through it and doing it through virtual. So we just have to be prepared to deliver the service the way we need to, especially during these times. And again, um, we, we are 100% here to answer your questions, not just waiting for um, one of these things to happen, uh, like a Zoom call or a webinar. If you, you want to reach out through text, email, phone call, it's uh, my pleasure. Uh, to, to talk to you guys. Tim, I do have a question. Yeah. First of all, I figured out how to put the SERP link on the chat. So yay, you learned something new today. Yeah. Sorry, the space didn't work out, so I did it the second time. Um, I noticed that later this week, there is a Bayview office meeting. Is that targeted just for the Bayview agents or is that open to everybody? It's open to everybody. So all okay. our so all our meetings are always open to everybody. Um, we're just... Uh, uh, also, at the same time, uh, trying to keep some form of routine uh, in the way we do our business, right? So um, all our training, all our office meetings, all our events, whatever we do at one office, it's one family, we, it's, it's open to everybody. Thank you. Yeah. I think, I believe that if you have the time, make the time, you're going to have a lawyer on a Zoom call. Right. So having a lawyer in a Zoom call and having Kriya themselves, who are who were our advocates for CERB, um, you know, the president and the incoming president of Kriya being on a call would be great for some commentary, questions, comments, you know, you name it. Well, with that, if there's nothing else to talk about, I mean, we can move on with our day. <laughs> all right thanks tim i appreciate uh, all my that pleasure. all the help and all that the help from everybody else as well so i appreciate it these will be thanks, uploaded everyone. will be uploaded i'm going to deliver it to uh to the office I have it uploaded I'll, I'll actually i'll upload it to uh net, the networking group uh, as soon as possible very good okay guys have a great day have a great day thank you